rarely. The introduction of a new device has the same impact as the Steam Deck, but almost a year after its presentation, even with the tremendous effort that Valve has made, getting one still takes one year of waiting or paying nearly double its price on eBay. And while today we can take its success for granted, it is not by sheer luck. It was the perfect combination between hardware and software, attached to a strategy planned almost 20 years ago. Let's see what makes the Steam Deck unique, and why Valve was able to do something we thought impossible. Become a major player in the console market overnight. Welcome back, I'm Claudio, and this is Zero to Tech. Today, app stores are a fact of life. Phones, consoles, any OS and all the game publishers have them. That is why it's hard to remember that Steam was the first case of massive success of this idea. And it's thanks to this vision that Valve had in 2002 that today we have the Steam Deck. Since they released the first version of Steam, Valve knew it had a dependency on Windows. And they were lucky for Microsoft the competence at the beginning of the century, which only had failures like games for Windows Live every time they tried to steal the market from Steam. Since then, Valve has sought to remove Microsoft from the equation, and even when they had already tried the idea of Steam machines, Linux computers that were supposed to compete with consoles, the timing was not good, especially the magic ingredient, Proton. The open source project made to run Windows games on Linux, which has matured to levels where most games can run. This added to the incredible performance and efficiency of AMD's RDNA 2 architecture also used in the PlayStation 5 and Xbox series, Valve has finally found the perfect time to deliver its promise of a new platform. One that not only removes Microsoft, but lets it enter in a new market with an extensive library of PC games. Because the console market is very complicated. Manufacturers usually sell the hardware at a loss, knowing they will make up the losses from game cuts. And with hardware negotiations in the million of units, all its new competitors which without an existing ecosystem, makes it impossible to sell at a competitive price. This is why devices like the Aya Neo and the One X Player are much more expensive. But if you already have millions of users, a store in which you already charge cuts for each sale, and you know you will sell millions of units, then you can create something new. That's why, after 20 years of careful planning, Valve is now a top tier player in the console market and they went all in with the promise of taking all your PC games and play them wherever you want. When we open the box, we see several phrases from different places you can play, written in various languages. On the left side, we have the 45 watt charger, and on the right side, we have the console. It comes with a very nice case to store it, and when you open it, you see the main dish, the Steam Deck, that we will check in depth in the next section. The case has a large hole in the back, covered by an elastic band. This allows you to put the charger there before you put the case into your backpack. But it would have been better if the compartment was inside. At least, you're not wasting space. Let's check the overall design. First, the format is not new. It's like the Aya Neo Next, which basically is a big portable console, with the screen in the center and the controllers on the sides. The screen is 7-inch IPS with a resolution of 1280 by 800 with touch. It has a maximum brightness of 400 nits and automatic brightness adjustment. And looks very good. There is enough resolution for the size, which is the main trick to run current games. It has two stereo speakers on the sides that sound great. Also, two small microphones on the top, barely visible. Where they broke the mold is in the controller, giving it more space. Here, you can see them compared to a Switch and to a PS Vita. In addition to the standard controls, we have two touchpads that remind us of the Steam controller and two function buttons called Steam and... Um, okay, three dots. <laughs> they have a strange feel when pressed. At the top, we have two volume buttons, a headphone jack, a USB-C port, an LED and the power button. And the top buttons with analog R2 and L2. At the bottom, we only have the microSD expansion. And at the back, we have four programmable buttons. The CPU is made explicitly for Valve. It has four Zen 2 cores with eight threads, which may sound little against eight cores of the Aya Neo Next, but the real magic is in the GPU, with eight RDNA 2 compute units. There are no Vega graphics. Therefore, 
Although it seems that it has less power, at least in games, it performs much better. It also has the usual suspects, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, vibration and motion sensor. And it comes with 16GB of DDR5 RAM. What changes between the versions is the storage, with three options, 64GB of eMMC memory, or 256 or 512GB of SSD. To tell the truth, the 64GB version is designed to be used with a microSD, but it uses a standard M2-2230 port, so upgrading the storage is not a problem. And that is precisely what we did. After some initial testing, we upgraded this 64GB unit. The process is simple. You just remove the screws on the back, you remove the lid with the splodger, then remove the protection shield. And you can now access the port where we remove the old one and put a new 1TB SSD. And after a typical installation process, we have 1TB available for our games. Let's not forget that it's an ordinary computer, but Valve did a great job creating an interface that any console user will feel comfortable with. No excessive configurations or need to use anything but a controller. This version of Linux is called Steam OS Hollow. And yes, it also has a desktop mode for the more technical users. You can even infect it with Windows. The best part is to access your entire Steam library. If you're like me, it is full of games that you shouldn't have bought in a summer sale. <laughs> but maybe with it, you will finally play them. The base system will be familiar to any Steam user, especially in big picture mode, with access to your games and the store. If you press the Steam button, no matter where you are, it shows a side menu with quick access to the main system modules. Actions like switching between games, going back to the main screen, or turning off the device are done with this menu. With the 3 dot button, another side that appears that lets you change some settings on the fly. The most interesting one is the battery section. It allows you to display performance number at various levels of details, ideal for test, and enable you to adjust performance details to limit the power usage. The best part is that this is done at system level, and you can do it while playing. You can change the watts, GPU speed, and scaling to find the best settings for the game. There are thousands of additional details, such as filters in the game store for games that won well, the compatibility icon in each one, or controller settings per game. Seriously, Valve did a terrific job of making it super easy, even for those who have never been PC gamers. But now, let's see the most important thing how good it is to play games. With the controller, Valve doesn't mess around. Both hardware and software are first class. These sticks are perfectly calibrated, rounded corners with no dead zones, and the position is quite good, further inside, so you won't touch them by accident like on many devices. Its error range is 12%, similar to all first party controllers. The first game I tried was Doom, which is better for PC due to its speed. But with these sticks, it works just as well as on any console. The long travel makes them very precise, ideal for aiming. The same in slower games like Deadloop. It's like you're playing with an Xbox or a PlayStation controller, perfect for whatever you want. The analog buttons also work well. Their throw is smaller than the Xbox and the PlayStation 5 controller. I would say it's the same as the PS4 controller. And very smooth, with perfectly linear input. They have no dead zones, so they work as you expect. We tested them with Forza Horizon, and very well. It's easy to tell how deep you're pressing when accelerating or braking. This gives you perfect control of the car. It's the closest to the original Xbox I have ever tried. By the way, we played this on Windows installed on a microSD, which shows you the flexibility of the device. The case for the D-pad is weird. It's in a position we have never seen before, very close to the edge. This works fine for the face buttons, but on the D-pad it's not ideal. Your finger must be in a completely vertical position. It performs well in the separation test, because you cannot mix directions by accident, but on the sequence test it's very disappointing. There is no problem doing sequences to the right, but doing them to the left doesn't work the same. As much as I tried, it never felt right. The rest of the buttons work very well. The front ones have the Xbox layout. Good, because they also feel like the Xbox controller with medium travel and very close to the edge. They are just a tad smaller and tighter together. Start and select are in a good position, and R1 and L1, although they are a little harder than usual, also feel good. 
What impressed me the most was the ergonomics. After the Aya Neon X, I thought that these devices had to be heavy and not so comfortable, but the Steam Deck proves me wrong. Being thinner, it weighed less, and it had space in the back to put your fingers. And they designed each cube and corner to fit your hand so you can play it for many hours without getting tired. Now, let's talk about the additional controls. First, the four programmable buttons on the back. They are large and a little harder to press than expected, but they're designed that way, so you won't push them by mistake. The best thing is that you can assign many functions, keyboard, mouse, control commands, whatever you want. With so much flexibility, they can be really useful. We also have the two touchpads. They have several options, from working like a regular mouse, to mapping them to analog sticks or tabs in specific points of the screen. They have a click, but I don't think you'll use it much, because clicking without moving the position of the touchpad is almost impossible. It also has a motion sensor, which can also be mapped to movements on the mouse or the sticks. It works well if you have played any Switch or Wii U games that use this mode, like Breath of the Wild, where you can make large moves with the sticks and find adjustment with the motion. And if you want to play with more friends, no problem. You can connect a USB-C hub to the Steam Deck and then to an external display, using the rest of the controllers via Bluetooth, or mouse and keyboard, or whatever you like. In Steam mode, when you connect it to an external TV, it sends all the video, turning off the screen like the Switch. But in desktop and Windows, you can use it as a second display, in case you're looking for productivity. And with everything you can play between Steam, Windows and emulation, you won't be short of excuses to use it. If there's one thing I can complain about, it's that it's big. It's not a device you can take with you like a phone or a Switch Lite. To carry it, you will need a backpack. Now let's do a quick performance check. First, let's quickly compare benchmarks to understand the difference between the Steam Deck and something like the Aya Neon X. And it is that, if we compare the results, we see how the Steam Deck surpasses the Aya in all the 3D tests without fail. On average, 15% more. But this does not tell the whole story. The story is entirely different if we check the CPU part or general ones like PC Mark. The Aya Neon X smashes the Steam Deck with almost 50% better score, because it has more cores and a new architecture with Zen 3. The last thing to mention is that the Aya Neon X was running at 32 watts, while the Steam Deck only at 15. It is a big difference, it's much more efficient. Being able to order a custom chip from AMD, Bob went from balance between CPU, GPU and power consumption specific for games, when off-the-shelf CPUs have to be always more balanced. And you can see the same difference in games. The most direct comparison we could do was with Deadloop. While in the Aya Neon X run between 30 and 40, the Steam Deck had a 15% better performance, all in the same settings, an average of 40 frames. In any case, more than enough to play. They are looking not to get the most frames, nor to compete with a PC with a graphic card that costs, weights, and consumes more power than the entire Steam Deck. Instead, it's only to being able to play, in low quality, with at least 30 frames per second. And it gives you a tons of settings to control it. Settings that go beyond the ones in the game. You can lower the refresh rate of the screen, force a frame limit, and manage the watts and frequency of the GPU. With all this, the idea is to find a sweet spot where the game runs well while consuming as little energy as possible. And while modern AAA games would need full power, you can turn it down with older or indie games to extend the battery life. With the heaviest games, don't expect it to last more than 2 hours. But we tried Sable at 9 watts, giving us more than 3 hours. And the Cells or lighter games can last 4 or even more. And remember that we are talking about a PC, so you are not limited to the built-in controller. You can connect a keyboard and a mouse to play shooters properly, or use a flight stick, steering wheels, gamepads, or whatever you like to play games with. Steam doesn't judge. The only limit will be if some drivers force you to use Windows. And as we have already said, with a USB hub and an external display, you don't have to limit yourself to the small screen. Valve announced that there will be a first-party dock, but by not releasing it yet, many companies have stolen the idea and it is not difficult to get one with a place for the console and all the connectors you need for reasonable prices. With this, you have the option to use it even as a home PC. 
Finally, you also have the streaming services. It doesn't matter if it's cloud or directly from your PlayStation or Xbox, or with Steam Remote Play if you have a much more powerful PC but you want to play in the party. You can use all the services. If there is one that is not natively supported, someone probably has already managed a way to make it work. For everything else, Windows is always just a reboot away. Now let's talk about emulation. Again, this is a PC, so we can go further than GameCube, Wii and PlayStation 2. Yes, we are talking about original Xbox with Shemu with an X, Wii U with Semu with C, PlayStation 3 with PCSX3 and Xbox 360 with Xenia. And why not mention it since we have a decent option to use, Nintendo Switch with Yuzu. And there have been significant improvements in many of these emulators. We can finally play Red Dead Redemption at playable speeds. But it's such a long topic that I couldn't include it in this video. Subscribe so you won't miss the exclusive video for emulation on the Steam Deck. More quality, more performance, better controls and finally, the cherry on the cake. Prices. Valve seriously went aggressive with the pricing, starting with $400 for the version that we saw here. Upgrading it to 1TB cost us about 90 US dollars, much cheaper than the next version which has 256 for 500, and the most expensive one that with 512 gigabytes and an additional anti-reflective glass cost 650. It's very aggressive pricing, especially when you consider that the competition starts at $900 for lower devices. The only problem is being able to buy it. Valve cannot cope with the demand. I ordered mine in December last year and just got it. But Valve is making a good impression. With a device that consolides PC games, but it is still an open platform that you can use for whatever you want. And mainly, without a doubt, a device that gives you access to the best emulation for the price. It just remains to be seen how it evolves in the future. Because while consoles have long lifespans, PC gaming changes much faster. And for their price, the only device that really competes with it is the Xbox Series S, in which you can also install emulators without having to hack or pay for development mode. Check this video to see how. Remember to like and subscribe. Remember, retro games, modern technology, zero to tech.